and welcome to another video. In this video, it's going to be quite long, uh, compared to my usual. Um, we're going to be going over the Space Launch System. Uh, it's pretty basic information, okay? We're not going to go really in, in depth to it. I'm not going to be talking about all kinds of crazy things uh, that, that might go deep into the weeds. We're going to keep it fairly simple, uh, as a lot of my videos are, uh, because they're targeted at the everyday person, okay? Uh, not people who are uh, chemists and engineers and, and things like that, and physicists and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, plus, it just gets boring after a while going that in depth. Anyway, um, so we're going to go over the Space Launch System, which is basically the core stage, the boosters, uh, and ICPS. We're going to cover that a little bit too. What we're not going to cover here is the Orion spacecraft. Uh, it's not part of the Space Launch System, that's, that's a payload. Technically, the ICPS is a payload as well, but whatever. Uh, it's part of the launch system, so I'm going to go over it, okay? At least as far as the launch system on the spacecraft is concerned, or on the rocket, all right? Uh, and then we'll be going over this as well back here, okay? The, uh, what we hope to see uh, during the launch, uh, some events that we, we hope to see, which are kind of like what you'll see in, uh, or have seen in the space shuttle, all right? Uh, as you see, I have a NASA shirt uh, here. It's not obviously not made by NASA. It's uh, from Kennedy Space, and I got it way back in the day. Um, so it was contracted out by the visitor center or whatever there, and uh, you know they decided what the design was going to be. But on the back, you can see it says this, or it's just, or it's only. I, think, I can't remember. It's only rocket science. Hmm? Well, there's a problem with that, and you know. People say that, oh, it's not rocket science, and I even say it uh, as a kind of a joke, right? Oh, it's not like it's rocket science. Yeah, it's a joke, whatever. Uh, but uh, this shirt is completely wrong. It's incorrect, utterly incorrect, because it's not rocket science. There's no such thing as rocket science. There never was such a thing as rocket science. What is it? Well, there might have been such a thing as rocket science. Uh, when well, you wouldn't have called it rocket science back in the day when people like Goddard were researching it. He was just a researcher, basically. Not just a researcher, but he was doing research. It wasn't necessarily rocket science, because uh, they didn't have rockets. <laughs> anyway, um, the point of this is, uh, we're not going to be looking at rocket science here, okay? It's not going to be complex. What we're going to be kind of getting into, just a little tiny bit, is astronautical engineering. And we're not even, we're just going to be touching the surface of it, okay? Barely. Uh, that's when people say rocket science, because there's no such thing as rocket science, there's no such thing as rocket scientists. What they are is astronautical engineers, okay? And these are people who go to school for astronautical engineering usually, okay? But there's a bunch of other fields that participate in this, including scientists. Uh, they go to school for astronautical engineering to design rockets and spacecraft. All right. This is really a subfield of aeronautical engineering, okay? Uh, but it's specialized, you know, that's why it's a subfield. Uh, so, like, again, when you hear people say, oh, such and such is a rocket scientist or whatever, unless they're joking, you know, being obtuse, so it's no rocket science, whatever, yeah. just remember, there's no such thing as rocket science, there's no such thing as rocket scientists, it is astronautical engineering and astronautical engineers who do a lot of this work, along with engineers in other disciplines, and yes, scientists as well, okay? And when we say scientists, we mean like physicists and chemists and things, uh, all right? So let's go over the solid rocket boosters on the space launch system. I just spit all over everywhere. Uh, luckily, you're on camera, not in front of me. Uh, so, like I say, let's go over the solid rocket boosters uh, for the space launch system. Now, on this diagram here, the solid rocket boosters, as you can see here, uh, are these items in blue right there, all right? Now there's two of them, okay? Uh, so let's take a look at all this information that we have here. Uh, these uh, solid rocket boosters are derived from the space shuttle uh, solid rocket boosters, okay? Uh, and they use the casing, that, how they're derived from those boosters is they use the casings from those boosters, okay? Now I'm not saying the casing design from the boosters, I mean, the physical casings that were flown with the space shuttles are being reused with these engines uh, to fly the space launch system, okay? And that's what I have written up here. 
They use those casings. Now, what are the casings? It's basically the shell, the portion of the uh, solid rocket booster that you see, the white tube, essentially. Okay. Uh, if when you see it on the shuttle or even on the uh, um, on the space launch system when it does launch, uh, you're going to see a big white tube. Or the thing that looks like a big white tube, and it's got what looks like black, uh, you know, a few black uh, bands running around it uh, as it goes, you know, along the lake. Okay. So that, those, that's the part that you see is the casing, all right? Now, uh, each of these boosters, and there's two of them, okay? Each booster weighs 800 tons, which is a heck of a lot of weight, all right? Uh, and it can produce a thrust of 1,800 tons. So with two of these things, you've got 3,600 tons worth of thrust that you can have that, that are being produced, all right? Now, they're not throttle, throttleable. Okay, it means, means you can't control the power that comes out of them. Once they're started, they're started, and you're along for the ride. Um, uh, so, that leads into the next uh, point here, is that these are solid propellants. Solid rocket boosters, solid rocket motors, means a solid propellant, okay? Unlike um, a lot of the rockets that you see, like especially with SpaceX, uh, that's the popular one here in the U.S. at least. Uh, we don't use liquid, <coughs> excuse me, we're not using liquid propellants with these boosters, all right? These are basically like if you've seen a model rocket engine like this, okay? This is a model rocket engine if you have never seen one before, okay? These boosters here are much larger, much more powerful, and quite a bit more complex versions of this, okay? This is solid. It's a solid fuel from the, this is the nozzle end here. I should probably put it the right way up. There we go. This is the nozzle end down here, and there is fuel all the way from the bottom to the top, almost to the top here, all right? Now, for this one, it's black powder, all right? So this is very simplistic, all right? But it works. For, it's a D12-0, okay? Which means the zero in there means there's no uh, ejection charge. But that's another topic. Or is it, is it zero as the ejection charge? Oh, no, there's no delay. I'm sorry, that, this is the zero here means that there's no delay. I haven't used my rocket engines in a long time. Anyway, <clears throat> so while the fuel for this is black powder, essentially, okay, <clears throat> the fuel for the solid rocket boosters here on the space launch system is aluminum powder. Yes, you heard that right, metal. Uh, it may seem strange to you that you're putting a bunch of metal into a place to get it to burn, to get a rocket to go. Well, that's how it works. Uh, the same idea was with uh, used in the space shuttle uh, boosters as well, okay? So aluminum powder fuel is what, what we're going to be using for the fuel here. <clears throat> and ammonium perchlorate is the oxidizer. Now, what does this mean, an oxidizer? Well, when something burns, you have a fuel and you have an oxidizer. And what happens, and we'll see with the chemical reactions here uh, later on, uh, I'm going to show you those, uh, not physically show you those, but write them out. Uh, I'll show you the chemical equations that, that say what's going on here, <clears throat> that demonstrate what's going on in these boosters. You have your, I guess from your view, it would be your oxidizer and, or I'm sorry, your fuel and your oxidizer. Your oxidizer combines with your fuel, it oxidizes your fuel, and will release energy, okay? And that's what's happening here, all right? Now, there's no way to get this aluminum or uh, by the, the, themselves, this uh, fuel and oxidizer, and neither of these really will provide any strength. Uh, they won't really stay together in, in the way we need them to in these, in these uh, rocket boosters, okay? So what, will, what they've added to them, they've suspended these, uh, the fuel and oxidizer in a binder, okay? And what that binder does is it keeps everything together, all right? And this binder is, is a tongue twister, at least for me, because I'm not a chemist. So. Uh, is it ammonium per... Oh, no, that's not. That's, that's, the, that's the oxidizer. It is a polybutadiene acro... Acrolo nitrile, which is probably why they have this abbreviation for it, the, the PBAN. Okay, and that's the binder that keeps that keeps the fuel and oxidizer together uh, so that they will be able to burn 
well, uh, so, and it, like, as intended. Okay. Now, we'll get to this process, uh, like I said, a little bit later on. Uh, and also, once these things are bound together in that binder, once everything's put together, uh, that binder, or what we'll call the grain, and we'll get into that as well, uh, of the fuel, it has a consistency or a feel like a pencil eraser, like a, a I guess if you're in the UK or perhaps Australia, you would say rubber. Uh, but it's like an eraser. It's a little bit, you know, uh, it's, it's firm, but it, it can flex, and you can kind of push it a little bit and squeeze it. All right? So the size of these things is, it's each one is 177, 177, right? Yes, yeah, 177 feet long from the top to the bottom here and 12 feet wide, all right? So they're pretty big. Uh, let's see here, they have a burn time of 126 seconds. So that, what that is saying is that from when this is lit, lit, we'll call it, or, or ignited, from when the engine is started, or whatever you want to call it, uh, for, for right now, uh, you have a burn time of 126 seconds until the fuel burns out, essentially, and the engine stops working, okay? Or the motor, these, these are, more correctly called motors, all right? The solid rocket boosters are usually called motors, not engines, okay? Uh, now, during this 126 seconds, these motors are burning or consuming 6.3 tons of this propellant every second. That's a lot of fuel being consumed, all right? Now, um, as you can see here, I've got these split up on this drawing. You can see the blue, uh, the boosters are split by little lines, all right, horizontal lines there. And that's for this, okay? Each one of these is split into sub-assemblies. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten, as you can see here, okay? And each one of these has its, its specific function, okay? So, First here at uh, A, we have a nose cone, and that is up here, okay, at the top. This is the nose cone, all right? Uh, now, uh, you also have the forward skirt, all right, which is B. It's right under the nose cone here. Now, this houses avionics that basically will control the booster, okay? And they'll communicate with the uh, main flight computers inside of the core, all right? Now, you have a bunch of motor segments. Now, each booster has five motor segments. Now, th these segments are where the fuel is, okay? So, not all of this booster is fuel. It's just five, five of the segments that it has are fuel, which are right here. Uh, C, as you can see, they're all labeled C, all right? Uh, so, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, five, six. Six? No, it should be five. So someone screwed up, and I think that someone was me. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, that's wrong. I'm going to have to correct that. Uh, I don't want to do it right now. I'll do it in between the videos. There's five of these segments, five of these motor segments, not six. Okay, and it's important uh, because you can contrast this with the shuttle. There were four segments. Okay, this each of these boosters has five segments. All right. Um, you have a nozzle here, which is down at the bottom, okay? It's not located on the bottom, but I, it, it's what you see coming out of the bottom there. The nozzle is actually a little bit up in there a little bit, all right? And that's letter D, okay? Now, this is, is what helps channel all of the reaction gases, all of the exhaust gases, essentially. Uh, out of the rocket and gives you really, that's really where your, your thrust is, is enhanced through that nozzle, all right? Now we have aft skirts. No, not the type of skirts that you wear when you're uh, playing bagpipes, but aft skirts, all right? They're just these things down here, E, okay? They're actually these little squares here, all right? But those house the control systems to move the nozzle around, okay? So it's thrust and vectoring, essentially. And actually, they're called, uh, yes, thrust and vector control system. That's what they're called, all right? So, uh, let's see here. We gotta move on to the next thing, but I'm gonna reset the camera and then we'll continue. So when 
the space launch system, when this rocket is sitting vertically on the mobile launcher, which you'll see uh, on the video, all right, the, the live feed that NASA is going to have out, the entire mass of this rocket and the payload and everything else is supported by these two solid rocket boosters, just like the space shuttle was, okay? So when they put, this thing is called a stack, all right? When they put the stack together, they start using, they start with, by building these solid rocket boosters up, okay? And there's a process to that. The first thing that they're going to do is they're going to make the uh, aft skirt to this aft um, uh, motor assembly, or, yeah, motor, to this aft motor segment here, okay? And uh, where do we have it? Where do we have it right here? Okay, yes, it supports the entire weight. We already went over that. Uh, the aft motor segment is, is mated to this aft skirt down here, so you get this item and this item or segment are mounted together, okay? Then what they're going to do is they're going to insert the nozzle up into there, all right? So the nozzle is installed, okay? And then after that, these three components that are now mated together are going to be bolted to uh, the mobile launcher, all right? So they, they will stand vertically on the mobile launcher there, all right? Now after that, these remaining four, again, remember I drew this wrong, there's, there's not six motor segments, there's five total. So the remaining four segments will be attached one atop the other uh, on top of each of these, or on top of the, uh, this segment that's already been bolted down to the mobile launcher, all right? So we're stacking it up, kind of like Legos almost, okay? If you want to look at it that way. Now, after all of those motor segments have been installed, all right, we've got a big tower of, of tower of power, I guess you could call it. Uh, the uh, forward skirt and the nose cone are installed, okay? Now, obviously, when all of these things are being put together, they're not just slapping them one on top of the other. There's, you know, connections, data connections uh, for communication from here to down there, from the avionics up here to down here that have to go and get connected and all that stuff, all right? So it's a little bit of a process, okay? Uh, also what you'll notice there's here is in these nose cones, there's a difference between the nose cones on the space launch system and those of the space shuttle, okay? They may look similar, but there's, there's a, a difference uh, between the function. These are purely aerodynamic. They're, there's nothing that they're really protecting necessarily, all right? Uh, but in the space shuttle, one of the things that was in the nose cones, or the, the thing that was in the nose cones, was the parachute. Because on the space shuttle, those were reusable, all right? The shuttle would jettison them uh, at a predetermined point in its launch, okay? They would fall down to Earth, and then you can see videos of this, on and NASA has videos. Uh, they would tumble down back to Earth, the parachute would pop out, and, and the... the it would pop out over the nose cone, you know, under the nose cone, and of course the booster would plunge back in, uh, nozzle first into the ocean, okay, and then float there, all right, until uh, they came and recovered, okay. But this system with uh, the space launch system, this they're not recoverable. They are just think we can go into the the wiseness or the utility or whatever you want to call it, the cost effectiveness of not reusing these things. Uh, but it is what it is. They're not reusable, all right? So as I said, yeah, they're not designed to be re reused. Uh, now, these are manufactured the same place that the shuttle boosters were manufactured at in Promontory, Utah, okay? After manufacture, they're checked out, and then they're, the, they're, these segments, all right, are packed up onto rail cars and transported by rail from Utah down to uh, Kennedy Space Center in, in Central Florida. All right. Uh, let's see here. I already went over. Let's see. The propellant is the consistency of an eraser. I already, already talked about that. Now, while we're talking about propellant, um, we'll talk about the grain. All right, because we're going to go into some talk about, like I said, the propellant here. All right. If you were to take one of these boosters here, these booster segments, the the motor segments in this booster, and you were to 
look at it from, you know, let's say this is one of the segments, one of the motor segments. If you were to take it and look at it from the end, what you would see is kind of like here, really. And if you probably can't see it very well on the camera, but you see that there is a case. This is the casing, the, the cardboard casing, essentially is a tube. And you'll see that there's a hole in the middle. All right. Now on this, that's the, that's the nozzle. But that hole goes all the way up through to almost the top of this. All right. Now on the top, it's solid. There's no hole in there. All right? Again, you're not going to see that on camera probably. But there's that that tube in there, that little hole goes all the way from the bottom where the nozzle is at to almost the top, all right? That's the grain, and, and in this particular thing, it's just a simple circular hole, all right? It's a tube that goes all the way up. That's the grain cross-section here. The, the grain is the fuel. The casing is right here, all right? This is the motor cross-section we're looking at, for example, from the top down, okay? Um, this has a cylindrical uh, cross section here, all right, or a tube or whatever you want to call it, okay. But there are other types of cross sections that you will find in solid rocket boosters. Here we have a double anchor, which hopefully it's easy for you to see on camera there. And we have a, a cross uh, grain pattern here, or ge grain geometry. Uh, we have a rod and a tube. Now, this is similar to this one. Uh, this rod and tube, tube construction, in that there is a rod of fuel in the middle here, all right? Then there is a, a void, like a circle, right here around the middle, all right? And that's where the combustion will happen in that particular case in the middle there, or, or not in the very center, but around that, that area, all right? Which is symbolized by this, right? You have a star configuration, okay, where instead of being just a hole, it's like a star shape kind of, all right? And you have a dual com composite. Now, this is a little more complex, which is, I'm not even going to try and draw it, uh, but uh, it's more complex. Uh, that's what I want to draw here. Now, what you'll see here is I've drawn with each of these, I've drawn a little picture to the side, okay? This is basically the thrust profile, all right? associated with each of these. Now it's not exact, but it will give you a general idea. Your double anchor type of profile will give you a large initial thrust and it will slowly peak down, all right, to, to zero thrust, and then at the end it drop off to zero, okay? Now a cross section here will give you a large initial thrust and then it will drop off and slowly go to zero. Now, the big difference here is that this one slowly proceeds to zero. This one has a drop off at the end, okay? The rod and, uh, I'm sorry, the, <laughs> the rod and tube uh, style here, uh, or grain geometry, uh, it will give you basically a even thrust, a constant thrust throughout most of the flight, all right? A star will do similar it will be similar to that, uh, but it will often have a little bit of a droop in the middle. So you'll have a, a, a constant thrust, mostly, but it'll sag a little bit in the middle as I'm drawn here. Hopefully you can see that on camera. Now the dual composition will give you an initial thrust that's large. That will decrease back and you'll get kind of a constant thrust in the middle of the burn. And then towards the end you'll get another spike in power. Okay? Now, this is important, um, obviously, or hopefully you can see, because you can tailor your rocket performance, your solid rocket booster performance, to the needs of the rocket, okay, by using these different cross-sections, all right? Now, the most common one that we see is this circular or tubular cross-section, all right? Now, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to redraw some of this stuff. We're going to put up the next topic with the solid rocket boosters, which is going to be going over some of this stuff down here, uh, how these burn and how, the, how you can get this type of flight profile from a particular cross-section. Uh, we'll also go to the chemical equations for this reaction up here between the fuel and the oxidizer. Uh, and um, then we'll continue on with something else. Moving along to uh, how the engine, or I should say the rocket motor, actually works uh, for the SLS, the solid rocket boosters. 
Uh, we're going to look at some mechanical equations. We're also going to go over um, a question that some people might have of if all of this stuff is so hot and everything, why don't the uh, the why don't the rocket boosters just melt? All right. So let's start by looking at what chemical process is going on inside of this booster while it's operating. All right. Now, for I'm sure many of you you have not seen something like this. It looks kind of like a math equation. It is a math equation, but it's not, or I'm sorry, it is an equation, but it's not a math equation. It's a chemistry equation, right? Uh, some of you may have seen this before and aren't familiar with how it works, and some of you may know how it works. Uh, either way, it's fine. You know, whichever way you're familiar with is fine, uh, because I'm going to explain this here as we move along, okay? So, what we have on this side of the arrow here we have inputs. These are chemicals or molecules that we're putting into a reaction, all right? And on this side are the products or the outputs, okay? The reactants or inputs, the products or the outputs, all right, uh, are on this side, okay? Uh, now, what we need to do is we will eventually go through and like in a math equation we will cancel things out all right we'll reduce we'll simplify so on and so forth okay but for right now let's start out by taking a look at the prod the reactions themselves okay we're going to line by line and go through these all right so we're going to start with ammonium perchlorate, uh, which I should say we're going to leave the binder out of this and we're going to consider the binders uh, reactions in this process, okay? We're just going to look at the fuel and the oxidizer, the reactions between those two uh, by themselves, all right? So we're going to take a look at this ammonium perchlorate. Now what is ammonium per perchlorate? If you're not familiar with chemistry, it is a salt. Now what is a salt? A salt is, of course, something that you use to put on your food. Uh, and that many people like and is necessary for life, but um, that's not the only definition of salt. That's like the layman's everyday definition for salt. That's just this white crystally stuff that I sprinkle all over my food and my popcorn and things. Uh, a salt is basically more of a chemistry type of uh, defini definition of a salt is it's a molecule uh, who can, or whose components can be split up to form a I, two ions, a positive ion and a negative ion, okay? Uh, those are cation, cations and, and anions, but we're not going to get into that. We're just going to go positive ion and negative ion, okay? Um, so that's more of a scientific or a chemistry type of definition of a salt, okay? And of course, I'm, as of all my videos, I'm simplifying this uh, for an instructional type of model, okay? For purposes of instruction, all right? Uh, so, salts will often dissolve in a solvent, okay? Like, for example, if you take table salt and you put it in warm water, stir it up some, the salt will dissolve. What's happening with that salt is that when it gets into that, uh, the solvent, which is the water, the sodium will dissociate from the chlorine, the sodium... Uh, Atom will disassociate in a C yeah in, in, in salt regular table salt it is one for one case uh, the regular regular sodium or the sodium molecule or I'm sorry the sodium atom will dissociate from the chlorine atom and you'll end up with two ions one is positively charged the other is negatively charged all right now uh, ammonia perchlorate since it's a salt will do the same thing given that it is in the proper solvent, all right? Now, what is one of the solvents for ammonium perchlorate? Well, the solvent for ammonium perchlorate is ammonium perchlorate. Imagine that. Strange. Um, so, in its solid form, this doesn't really react with much at room temperatures, okay? It kind of is basically stable. If you melt this, though, what will start to happen is there will be chemical reactions in this because this this uh, ammonium perchlorate is going into more of an ionic form, all right? Which I have written down here. Uh, C is NH4 with a positive, and then the ClO4 with a negative, all right? 
This NH4 is the ammonium. Don't confuse it with ammonia. Ammonia is NH3. Okay. This is NH4, which is ammonium. All right. And you have your perchlorate ion right here, which is a negative charge. Okay. The ClO4. Okay. So what we have coming into this this part of the reaction here. We have some nitrogen, some hydrogen, some chlorine, and some oxygen. Okay. And what we're going to look at is we're going to take six ammonium perchlorate uh, molecules and break those down through this process into other molecules. All right. Now, when this happens, when this goes into an ionic form of solution, certain reactions start to happen. Okay. And the products of this are here on this top line. You get three nitrogen gas uh, molecules out of it, which is 3N2. Well, if you're familiar with chemistry, N2 means there's two nitrogen molecules there, or atoms, I should say, in that molecule. And we have three of those for a total of six nitrogen atoms. We go back over here, we see six N. We have six NH4. We have six of these molecules. Each one of these molecules has one nitrogen in it, therefore we have a total of six nitrogen. So six nitrogen, six nitrogen in, a total of six nitrogen out. Okay? Now another product from this reaction that's going to happen here are going to be six uh, chlorine dioxide molecules here. Okay? Now we can go back and check if that number is correct. How many chlorines do we have coming in? With these, molecule, with, with these molecules here. We have, there's a, one chlorine here, but we have six molecules total. So that's going to be six chlorines. Okay, so we've got six chlorines. That's good. How many oxygen models total? Models. <laughs> How many oxygen atoms do we have coming in with this reaction? All right. Six, there, there's, there are four oxygen uh, atoms in this molecule here times Six, uh, sorry, four times a total of six molecules is 24 oxygen atoms, okay? Well, we see six times two, that's 12, okay. Is there any other stuff coming in? Yes, over here, so we'll take a look at that next. This checks out good so far. Um, so we'll get some water out of this as well, because the hydrogen has to go somewhere, because we have hydrogen here. It's going to make some water. We're going to get 12 water molecules out of this reaction as well. So we have 12 oxygen molecules there, plus our 12 oxygen molecules here. That equals the 24 that we have coming in. We're good there, all right. Uh, we have 12 hydrogen, uh, or should I say, did I say oxygen molecules? I meant atoms, atoms. I, can't, I don't know why I keep doing that. We have 12 hydrogen, uh, or have 12 water molecules, each with two hydrogen atoms. For a total of 24 hydrogen atoms, do we have that over here? H4, we have four hydrogen atoms per perchlorate molecule, or so, uh, 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 sodium perchlorate. Ammonium perchlorate molecule and six molecules for a total of 24, so 12, uh, does it good? Yeah, 12. 12 times 2 is 24, so we're good there. So this line checks out. We, everything here is balanced, okay? Now what's interesting about this reaction, uh, this was the one that's going to take a little bit longer, uh, is that, uh, obviously, you know, I'm not a chemist. I, I have studied chemistry, but I'm not a chemist. That's not what I do, all right? Uh, so I actually I had to look up this, how this breaks down to form the needed or the required oxygens to get down here, which we'll get to in a moment, all right? Um, so it took a little bit of research because it doesn't seem like this is very uh, well documented, at least online. So it took a little bit of research. I researched or I looked up all sorts of uh, documents you know, and uh, things to see this chemical breakdown and how it works. Uh, I went with some paper and I, I wrote things out. I did this for various uh, reactions and wrote, you know, tried to balance everything out, see if everything worked. Um, and uh, this is what the one that I came up with, or I saw that worked here. All right. Um, the initial question was, 
I need the oxygen molecules, like I said before, to bind to my aluminum, okay? Uh, where am I going to get those oxygen molecules? How do I free those oxygen molecules from up here? How do I free them in the correct proportions and numbers with everything else to get the, the products, okay? You can look this up on NASA's website itself. This will tell you the products. That website will tell you the products of the reaction that's going on inside this booster, okay? My problem was going, like I said, trying to get this uh, information right here. Particularly, this part right here was the problem, okay? Uh, so, like I said, I went through various documents going way back to, you know, the 60s um, and even some newer ones. Uh, and what was interesting about them, and of, of course, this seems like a bit of a side, but this is a science, technology, engineering, and mathematics video, okay? We're not doing just, I'm telling you the facts. We're going through some history, some processes, things like that. Uh, there are a bunch of, of, of hypotheses for how this process breaks down that I was reading about, okay? How these molecules break down and react with each other and so on and so forth to give you the required uh, reagents you need, you know, for your reaction, okay? Um, and it was interesting to read some of these uh, documents because what they were doing is they were allowing this reaction to happen. And they were looking at it with uh, spectrometers, and from that, inferring what's going on, what chemicals are, they're seeing, what chemicals are present during the reaction, which was kind of neat, okay? Uh, so I did get this one here, which we're going to continue on with, uh, uh, right here, all right? Let me reset the camera before we continue. So continuing on, uh, we have two of our products already up here in blue. We have some uh, nitrogen gas and we have some gaseous water, steam, water vapor, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we're not being too technical with those terms. It's water gas, water vapor, whatever. All right. Now, NASA's own website says that out of this reaction we're going to get three nitrogen gas molecules. That matches what we have up here. We're good. Okay, uh, we do have a discrepancy though. We're getting 12 uh, water molecules out of here. NASA's website only says we get nine. Okay, so there's a discrepancy. Uh, plus, we haven't gotten any hydrogen chloride out of here, and we've not gotten any, of course, since we haven't added our aluminum into this reaction, we're, we're not going to get that. Okay, uh, so the next step in this process is to break this hydro, or, uh, chlorine dioxide down. Now, when I was looking it up, does chlorine dioxide break down in this type of environment? The answer is yes. It does break down and it is going to be useful for us. Or it will be useful for us in this equation. Chlorine dioxide will break down into chlorine monoxide, all right, plus an oxygen atom. Okay, uh, is that right? Six chlorine, we should be getting, wait, wait for it, wait for it, let me look, let me look. Uh, six ClO2, yeah, that's correct, yeah. This is some stuff I was working on. So this is correct, yes, I, I, I uh, missed the O there. So we get six chlorine monoxides and six oxygens out of this. Aha! Here's where we're coming in to getting our oxygen, right here. But we're still low on our oxygen because we need a lot more oxygen than this, than six, to continue this process. Plus, what we, we have a problem with, too, is we don't have chlorine uh, monoxides down here in our, in our, our uh, uh, the products that we're getting out of this reaction, all right? Uh, so, the next thing to figure out is, will chlorine monoxide break down in the presence of water to give us some more oxygen, okay? Now, if we look that up, we find no, it won't. But it will break down um, and yield oxygen, okay? So, if you take six of these, six chlorine monoxides, and you put them in this type of environment, they will react to form 
three chlorine molecules, okay, Cl2, okay, plus six more oxygens. So it looks like we're on our way to where we need to be here. We've got 12 oxygens so far. Now we've got this chlorine, which we can possibly react with some of these excess waters we have up here, all right, to form this hydrogen chloride that we're ultimately going to need and free some extra oxygen to put with our aluminum, okay? Now, will chlorine break down in the presence of water to form some, pro or, uh, some things that we can use in, in, in the reaction further? The answer is yes, it will, okay? If you take three water molecules and you add three of these chlorine uh, gas molecules, okay, what you'll get is six hydrogen chloride molecules and three oxygen atoms. So it looks like we are well on our way to where we need to be. We have six hydrogen chlorides out of there. We have six hydrogen chlorides that is listed as one of the products on the NASA website, okay. So we're good. So far, we have everything except this aluminum molecule, this aluminum oxide molecule, all right? So can we build this in the proper numbers given our oxygen, our free oxygens here, and some aluminums? The answer is yes. If we take 10 aluminum uh, atoms and we add 15 oxygen atoms to those and let them react, let those react together, what we'll get is five aluminum oxide molecules, all right? So we're good. We have some aluminum oxide coming out of this business here, okay? Now, what we do is we want to check our work. This is where this type of thing comes in very useful, is we want to check if this reaction that we have written down is correct, at least numbers-wise and proportions. So what we do, like with a math equation, is we look at each side of this, and we cancel like terms, if they're cancelable, or we reduce like terms, okay? So, do we have, on the other side of this equation, an ammonium perchlorate molecule, right here in pink? Do we have this anywhere over here? No, we don't. So what we do is we bring this down below our little uh, line here, we bring that down, okay, downstairs, all right? And you can do it, you can, it's preference, you can go from here to there next, or you can go down to the, the, the line under it next, it's however you want to do it. For purposes here, I'm just going to come down here. Do we have any chlorine dioxide molecules on the other side of this equation? The answer is yes, we do. How many do we have? Do we have six? Yes, we have six. So what we can do is if, well, I'm not going to do this part, I'll just use this one. So I can completely cancel these out. And since they're completely canceled out, we don't bring them downstairs here, all right? Now we're going to continue on. Do I have six chlorine monoxide molecules on the other side of this equation? Yes, I do. I have that one there I can cancel, and this one here I can cancel. Now you see how this is working, okay? Now I'm going to come down here. Do I have any water molecules on the other side of this equation that will cancel this out? This is a little, an interesting example because we're, they're not equal, but we do have water molecules on both sides. So what we can do is that one's 12, this one's 3, so I can completely get rid of this one here, boop, like that, and I can cross out the 12, and I can write... 9 here, so we'll just put 9, I guess, right there, perhaps, okay? So that becomes 9 here, uh, and we can bring it down uh, right here, 9 water molecules, okay? Do we have any more of these uh, chlorine molecules over here on this side? Yes, we do. So. We have three on this side, three on that side, so these will cancel, okay? And we don't need to bring those down because they've canceled out, okay? Now, I have 15 oxygens over here. Do I have oxygens over there on that side? Yes, I do. How many do I have over there? I have 6, 12, 15. 
Okay, so this cancels out and all of these cancel out. Okay, hopefully this is making sense to you. Now, do I have 10 aluminum molecules over here? Do I have the aluminum molecules here? Or not molecules, atoms. 10 aluminum atoms on this side. Do I have any 10 aluminum atoms on this side? No, I do not. So I can go ahead and bring those down on this side here, okay? Moving to this side, because uh, we finished moving everything downstairs on this side, there's no other nitrogen because we've already checked on this side. So we move this nitrogen down here, these three uh, nitrogen uh, molecules. Uh, we move our water molecules down here. We have nine of those. We move our six hydrogen chloride molecules here, down below uh, or downstairs here, and our five aluminum oxide co uh, compounds. Uh, molecules downstairs there, okay? So if we put ammonium perchlorate, six ammonium perchlorate molecules in with 10 aluminum atoms, heat them up and allow them to relatively high heat uh, and allow them to react with each other, what we're going to get out is three nitrogen molecules, six water molecules, six hydrogen chloride molecules, and five aluminum oxide molecules. Is that, is that I think that's just regular aluminum oxide. It could be wrong. Uh, so that's how the chemical reaction works. Okay. So next, I'm going to go over the process of the burning inside of the the, uh, the solid rocket booster itself, uh, and some of the things related to that. Continue along with our solid rocket booster uh, information presentation, whatever you want to call it. I guess you could call it an informal lecture if you wanted to, very informal. Uh, continuing on, we're going to take a look at how this thing burns. Not the chemical reactions, but how it, the physical, what it looks like when it's burning, how, it, how the, the rocket burn proceeds, okay? So, as I said earlier, the middle of these, these rocket, uh, uh, solid rocket boosters, there is a void, an air pocket running, basically a tube, running from almost the top of this uh, topmost uh, motor segment all the way down to where the nozzle is, okay? And again, we can, we can see that on this primitive rocket engine uh, here, model rocket engine. We've got this hole right here. This is the nozzle end. This is the nozzle right end. You can see the nozzle. This is a, a ceramic nozzle here, okay? That hole goes all the way, all, almost all the way to the top, okay? It's, a, it's basically a tube in there, a, a, a void, an air, a tube-shaped void of air in there, all right? Now, what I've done is I've taken one of these solid rocket boosters, we flipped it over on its side so that the nose cone end is on this side, and the nozzle end is on this side. I, I've omitted the nozzle and the aft skirt because we don't really care about that for this. Uh, I put the nose cone in there just for completeness, just to give you, hey, this is the nose cone end. There you go, you can see it. Uh, and what I've done is I've drawn, uh, here in brown is obviously the boosters, these are the, the motors, okay, all stacked together as one giant motor or rocket booster, okay. Uh, the casing is here in brown for this. The brown represents the casing, which in this, would, in our solid rocket boosters, it would be that white, what you see, the white part, all right. And this, it's this, this, uh, this cardboard and uh, some sort of adhesive uh, part here. That's what these are made of, cardboard and adhesive. All right, just kind of like your paper towel rolls or toilet paper rolls. Um, so that's what this brown represents is the casing. Uh, again, the brown up here just represents the nose cone, blah, blah, whatever. All right, blah, blah, blah. Now, the blue in here represents the propellant, and remember our propellant is a mixture of fuel and oxidizer. So the blue here represents the propellant, okay? And through the center of that propellant, what I've drawn is that void, that air, air void in there, that cylindrical shaped air void that goes from the nozzle end to almost the very other end of the rock, or uh, solid rocket booster, almost the other end, all right? But not quite, okay? So that's how this structure is if you were to take one of these solid rocket boosters and look at it from the side, okay? Look inside of it from the side, okay? Uh, again, if you look at it on the end, one of these motor casing cross-sections, you'd see it looks like this. Here's that void, 
This void is the same void that runs all the way up through. This is the fuel, and this is the casing. Okay, this is the fuel grain here, fuel grain there, whatever. Um, that's the structure of this thing, the, the, the overall structure. We're not going to get into real detail with this. Now, what I've drawn here uh, in these four little pictures is the, how the cross-section of this looks as the combustion proceeds. Okay, so for example, when we first light this thing off, all right, it's going to look like this. The combustion is going to be happening right in that little area, which is right in that little area all through here, all right. As we step through time, and the combustion proceeds through time, this area here is going to get larger because we're burning fuel, okay, and it's going to expose more fuel to be burned. All right, uh, more fuel at once. So we'll have a little bit here, and then we'll have a lot more fuel exposed to burn there, and then quite a lot more fuel exposed to burn at this point here, and so on down the line until the rocket basically just doesn't necessarily run out of fuel. There's quite a few uh, other items that, or uh, conditions that this needs to burn like this efficiently, uh, pressure, temperature, so on and so forth. But for our all intents and purposes, this will proceed like this until the rocket runs out of fuel, okay? Now, I talked about where this thing is ignited from. As I said before, these model rocket engines are ignited from the nozzle end, okay? Not so with these solid rocket boosters for the uh, space launch system and the shuttle. These are ignited from the nose cone end or the other end, or whatever you want to call it, the fore end, <laughs> not aft end, okay? And the igniter is up in here, all right? Up in the top of this uh, uh, booster, which if we look at it up here, the igniter would be right up in, in this area, okay? Right up in here, all right? And what happens when this igniter, what is the physical process that happens for this igniter to ignite the fuel. Well, first off, it gets hot, okay? We need to melt this uh, ammonia perchlorate. We need to melt that in order to get it to go into uh, an ionic type of situation, okay? So this igniter, one thing it does is it melts our ammonium perchlorate so that we can get that ionic uh, action going on, okay? Uh, that the salt's going to do there because it's a salt. Uh, what is the other thing that it's going to do? Well, it's going to provide a lot of heat. Uh, because we don't only really need heat to get this thing here happening, to get this to go into this ionic form. We also need heat to get uh, uh, these reactions happening down here. Okay, so it's going to start that up. The igniter is going to start that going. And we'll also need a little bit of heat to get our aluminum and oxygen put together like we need them. Okay? And that's what this igniter is doing. So it, provides that energy in the form of heat to get this process, to kickstart this process. Now, does this igniter keep going once that has happened? Well, no, it doesn't for several reasons, because once it is in, not in contact or in close proximity to uh, this uh, our, uh, uh, propellant mixture, there's no way that that heat can really get to it efficiently or effectively, all right? Plus, once this starts to happen, remember I said this gives off a ton of heat energy, okay? That heat energy is going to spread to the, to the propellant that is surrounding the area that it's, it's burning, okay? And it's going to perpetuate this process up here. So this process is going to continue on. Also, think this is going to expand. Remember, we're in a solid state up here. Before any of this gets ignited, this is all solid, okay? When it melts, and when it burns, it turns into a gas. I should say after it melts and then when this chemical reaction happens, these are all gaseous, okay? So these have, this expansion is happening. All this stuff's going to expand. It needs somewhere to go. So it's going to start, it can't go that way. It can't go back forward. It can't go out to the side. So it's only got one way to go, and it's in this way. So all of this mass, all these molecules here, they have a bunch of heat energy. They're going to carry that heat energy out this way as they travel. And that's going to start this process happening all the way down this booster, all right? So it's going to start here, 
and it's going to quickly, very quickly, move all the way down this booster, okay? So we'll have all of this ignited and burning at the same time, okay? So we're not burning from one end. We're burning from the center out. And this, and this happens very quickly, all right? So that's how we're going to get there, is our igniter is going to kickstart this process, then this process, because the amount of energy it generates, is going to be self-perpetuating, all right? Now the gas is going to be expelled out of here, out of uh, the nozzle end, and we're not going to get into the nozzle, but it, it goes this way, therefore a rocket goes that way, right? <laughs> so that's what happened. Now the velocity of, uh, of our exhaust here, out of this solid rocket booster, can be on the order of, uh, say, 5,600 miles per hour. That's how fast this gas is traveling out of this rocket, okay? Uh, of course, that's with nozzle, uh, nozzle that will uh, affect this as well, enhance it, and so on and so forth. All right. Uh, so that is how this burns. Okay. Now, this is acting as insulation. Now, we see we've got perhaps 6,000 degrees here, but this fuel is acting not only as a fuel, but as an insulator. Okay. So it is helping to insulate our, uh, our casing here from this 6,000 degree reaction going on inside, all right? Uh, and so that, that will help ensure that our casing and our boost, therefore our boosters, maintain structural integrity so that they don't get, number one, just, they, may, they don't have to melt completely uh, to lose structural integrity. Uh, this kind of goes back to the 9-11 conspiracy thing. A metal, a structure, does not have to melt, completely melt and turn to liquid for something to lose structural integrity. It can just get hot, and it will get ductile and pliable, and you're easily bendable, okay? You can easily bend it. That is a loss of structural integrity. So we don't want this to melt, that's obvious, but we don't want the casing to lose its structural integrity either, and that's one of the functions of the fuel, is providing an insulator of sorts uh, to help us maintain that structural integrity. All right. Now this also does have insulation in it. Okay, the, our our uh, casing here it does have some insulation around on the inside. All right, but it's that insulation alone is no is not going to stop six thousand degrees uh, of these are going to get hot. Okay. Um, plus you got all of this heat is is not necessarily moving out this way. The heat and stuff, with all the energy really is getting shot out this end, or it's moving out, I guess you could say, this end, okay? Uh, and so that is basically how that works. Uh, now, our circular tubular uh, grain uh, geometry here gives us a certain thrust profile. And when I've drawn that here, all right, very generally speaking, we're going to start with a little bit of thrust, and it's going to increase over the duration of the burn to a maximum and then drop off rapidly, okay? Now, why is that? Well, I've already kind of covered it here. Initially, there's a small amount of area exposed to the hot gases from which we can burn. So there's a small ignitable area, if you want to call it that, okay? A small flammable area of flammable uh, volatile compounds that are burning, all right? As the burn increases or progresses, that area gets larger and it exposes more fuel to be per, burned per unit of time. Okay, does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. That is what we or I've, I've drawn here, okay? If we're burning more fuel per unit of time, we're going to have more thrust, so our thrust will increase. Uh, why might we want our solid rocket boosters, particularly the solid rocket boosters, to have this sort of thrust profile? Uh, on Earth or in the atmosphere, and especially in a thick atmosphere, is very important um, because of aerodynamic uh, stresses on the spacecraft due to aerodynamic pressures and things like that, okay, aerodynamic drag and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, I guess I'll explain it. Uh, if you're not aware, the Lower an altitude, the lower your altitude, or the closer to ground you are, the thicker the atmosphere is. Now, the thicker your atmosphere is, the more resistance you're going to have 
when you try to move through it from that air, the air resistance. Okay, it's going to resist movement more. All right. Uh, you've probably done this when you were a kid. You're moving 25 miles an hour in a car. You stick your hand out the window. There's eh, whatever. Okay, who cares? Not much resistance. You're moving 75 miles an hour down the interstate. You stick your hand out of the car. You get, you know, it's a little bit of a workout sometimes to keep it there. That's what's going on. The same thing is going on with, with these spacecraft, with the space launch system and with the shuttle, okay? If you can imagine going, sit, uh, let's just say, 2,000 miles an hour through the atmosphere, or even 500, um, imagine your hand, how stressful it's going to be trying to keep your hand out the window steady, okay? The pressure from the air hitting your hand is getting, because you're trying to resist it, it's getting transferred through your arm, you know, out your, or through your hand, from your hand, through your arm and your joints and all that, ultimately into the car, okay? So you have to realize that there's going to be a lot of stress on this spacecraft as it is moving through the atmosphere, okay, as during launches, it's, it's going up through the atmosphere. Now, the, that stress is the greatest near sea level, and this thing's going to be launched from basically sea level, okay? If you remember, uh, in the shuttle days, you would hear the go with throttle up type of thing. What was happening there was the shuttle was going through a maximum uh, max Q or maximum uh, loads on the structure of the spacecraft all right, as it was ascending and accelerating uh, through the atmosphere. Once it got through that max load, you were okay. They could throttle up and give more power to get more, more speed or velocity. We're using interchangeably here, even though they're not the same thing. Uh, more speed and velocity to the spacecraft, all right? Because they'd already overcome those, uh, gotten out of those aerodynamic loads, all right? So that's what happens with this. A similar thing is going to happen to this. So here, when you're closer to sea level, you want with solid rocket boosters, particularly because you cannot control their thrust. Their thrust is set. It's set at how the thing burns, all right? According to this and this, have the fuel type and configura configuration geometry on uh, cross sections, the side thing, you know, all this stuff. So you can't really control the thrust, okay, as needed. It's already set. So what you're going to want is a little bit lower thrust, closer to the ground, and then greater thrust or higher thrust as you get past that point of maximum uh, aerodynamic forces, okay, and aerodynamic stress on the uh, spacecraft, okay. Now what you might want in reality with these solid rocket boosters is you might want a little bit of a spike in the beginning to get you up and going better, all right? And then you might want it to, to kind of level off a little bit uh, as you're getting closer to those uh, maximum uh, uh, aerodynamic forces and stresses. And then after that's over, continue up to your maximum you know, uh, thrust. But again, overall, you're going to get this type of curve, okay? Uh, so let's see, we've gone over this, we've gone over that, we've gone over all of this stuff here. Oh. Uh, I believe I did say that the velocity of this is uh, 5,600 miles per hour, which is pretty darn fast. All right, so that is it uh, for this. Let's take a look at the space shuttle, or I'm sorry, space launch, not space shuttle, space launch system's uh, core stage, system core stage, which is in this drawing shown in orange, all right? the uh, largest single component of the space launch system. It's also uh, not only orange on the board, but is it orange as you will see in pictures and uh, video footage of the space launch system. And we'll get to why it's orange here in a bit. Uh, now if you are astute, or perhaps even if you're not astute, uh, you will have noticed that this thing looks an awful lot, this core stage looks an awful lot like the space shuttle external fuel tank. And, well, the reason for that is because it is derived from the space shuttle fuel tank design. It's the same diameter as the space shuttle fuel tank. However, it is, like, longer. It's just stretched, essentially. 
it's a little bit reworked as well. It's, it's uh, you know, have to have a little bit of a different internal structure, but overall it's, it's generally the same. Uh, so, as I said, it's derived from the spatial external fuel tank. Now, those of you who like uh, metallurgy or material science or, uh, you know, even if you did like uh, machining and things like that, if you're a machinist or whatever, uh, perhaps this might interest you. It's made from 2219 aluminum. Now, that's just a type of aluminum. There's various types of metals, uh, alloys and things, and usually they're numbered. All right. Uh, this particular one is 2219 aluminum, and one reason you would make something like this out of 2219 aluminum is because it has a high fracture toughness. It's resistant to fractures, all right? And you also find that 2219 aluminum is used in uh, high-speed aircraft and things like that, okay? And uh, so this is an application where you want that type of uh, metal, okay? Especially because this is, this is structural. This stuff here is structural, all right? Uh, and this 2219 aluminum is approximately 19% or 20, 19, 92% aluminum, 2% copper, and 2% other. And that other is like magnesium, silica, I think it was silicon was in there, maybe, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, just other uh, impurities and things they intentionally add to the aluminum, all right? Uh, this is also 212 feet in length and 27.6 feet in diameter. And as you see here, the diameter of this tank is the same as was the shovel. Okay. The thing weighs 94 tons empty. Okay, not full empty, it's 94 tons. Uh, it holds 150 tons of liquid hydrogen and... Uh, 930 tons of liquid oxygen, so that is a lot of mass that is in there. This alone is over a thousand tons, okay? Uh, now, we're going to get to the color here. The orange color is due to the spray-on insulating foam. Now, the reason that uh, I'm going to go on about the foam here is because uh, there's been you know, the issue in uh, 2003, I believe, with Columbia, uh, if you're not familiar with that. Uh, there were two shuttle accidents uh, that happened in the history of the shuttle where uh, lives were lost and spacecraft were lost. Uh, the first one was a Challenger. That was an explosion on launch, on ascent. Um, and the second one was a disintegration on re-entry of uh, Columbia, all right? Now, what happened with Columbia was during launch, some of this, uh, this foam that's on this tank, about, uh, I think it was a pound of it or something like that, a briefcase size or so, uh, peeled off. It came off of the upper area of the tank and 500 miles an hour or so hit the leading edge of one of the shuttle wings, all right? Uh, they caught all that on camera, so on and so forth, uh, and eventually, or essentially what happened uh, is that knocked a hole in the carbon, uh, I believe it's carbon, uh, carbon fiber, I think it's a carbon composite uh, leading edge thing covers they had there, or structure they had, uh, knocked a hole in that, so on re-entry, the, the hot plasma that was being generated uh, from re-entry uh, could enter through that hole and melt, essentially melt the stuff from the inside out, melt the aluminum and everything uh, from the inside out. And that's a whole other processor subject. But the foam is what initially caused or was what caused that issue, or that problem, okay? Now, the orange color of that foam, or the, the, the orange color of the tank is due to that foam, okay? The foam is a spray-on uh, insulating foam, and it's yellow when it's applied. It's not a bright yellow uh, like you would typically find in a crayon box or a, a color. It's more like a, a dull, very light yellow, okay? Uh, and when it's initially applied, it's yellow. It stays basically yellow until it's exposed to UV light. It's, that's not on purpose or anything. It's not like they intentionally had it go orange, you know, or make this thing, this foam so it turns orange when it's exposed to UV. It's not for inspection purposes or anything like that, it just turns orange, 
You spray it on, it's yellow, it dries, you put the tank outside of the sun, it turns orange because of ultraviolet light. Okay? Now, uh, this is applied by hand and machine at the factory. Okay? Um, additional coatings uh, can be, uh, let's see, oh, uh, additional coatings can be applied to protect the foam, but it's not worth it. And, and I don't mean additional coatings of foam, I'm talking about coatings once the, once the foam has been applied and is, is dry, a paint sort of coating, uh, a paint could be applied over that uh, to protect it from the UV because UV will break this down, okay, UV will affect it. Uh, that was done on uh, the first shuttle flight. You see the external fuel tank there was not orange, it was white, and that's because they painted it white to protect the foam. They basically figured out that the cost of that foam as far as weight goes, the benefit from that, that cost and weight wasn't, didn't return. Okay, it wasn't worth the, the, the cost. Uh, so they just stopped painting that, the, the uh, fuel tanks after that. And they let them just be natural orange, be their natural orange, all right? So that's what this means, all right? It's not talking about additional coatings of foam, it's additional coatings as in of other materials, like protective coatings, okay? Uh, now, one of the things this does, uh, this, this foam on this tank, um, it, it keeps, helps keep the tank cool while the, uh, the spacecraft is sitting on the launch pad and being refueled because you got to remember these liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen are very cold, like two, negative 200 some Fahrenheit, negative like 400 and something Fahrenheit, all right? So they're pretty cold in there. So you need that foam on the outside of the, the, the tanks to help keep them cool uh, while it's sitting there on the pad being fueled and waiting for launch. But also after the spacecraft takes off, the foam then kind of transitions, or the foam itself doesn't transition, but the purpose of the foam, uh, one of the purposes also is uh, to minimize the heat transfer from atmospheric friction, okay, into the fuel. Um, because when this thing is going through the atmosphere at a, at a high rate of speed, it will heat up, okay? And what you want to do is minimize the transfer of that heat from the outside, from the skin of the uh, spacecraft into the fuel, okay? Because you need that fuel to remain liquid uh, for reasons which we'll go into later. Uh, now, what's interesting about this, and we'll, we'll see it later, is that um, on the tanks in here, there's two tanks. Uh, one for liquid hydrogen and one for liquid oxygen. The tank walls are also the structure that you see here, okay? Uh, so let's see here. We'll get on to that later, though. Uh, so protects from atmospheric heating due to atmospheric, protects from heating due to atmospheric friction. Uh, now, the foam, foam thickness varies uh, according to where on the tank it, the foam is applied, okay? It varies from one half to two inches thick. It can be thicker in some areas. Uh, now, an interesting thing about this is most of this foam is applied spray-on at the factory, okay? Some of the foam is applied at the factory also, but it's not sprayed on. Uh, it is basically cast in, in a form, if you want to call it that, that dries up and then they apply it, okay? Uh, and they make those forms using 3D printing, okay? Uh, now, um, some of these prefab things can also be ex uh, installed, or are also installed at the Space Center while they're building up the stack, because some things you just can't, you, you have to have access to certain areas that can't be foam, and you have to apply foam later, and that's how some of these areas work on here, all right? This foam is a closed cell polyurethane foam mac manu manufactured by NCFI polyurethanes, okay? Now, what does this closed cell polyurethane mean? What is that? Well, a foam is basically like bubbles. If you blow, like you fill up your bathtub and you put soap in there, or even your sink, you put soap in the sink, all right? The water comes in and you get all these bubbles. It's a foam, okay? If those bubbles are closed and they're complete bubbles, okay, that's closed cell type of foam. If those bubbles have, uh, if they form and, and they uh, are not completely closed, that's an open cell 
well, enough cone cells better insulation properties, okay? And also has some uh, better mechanical properties for things like this. If you have an open cell foam, it's less insulative value, and it's also squishy. It's kind of, you can kind of squish it, okay? So this stuff's more rigid, okay? Uh, let's see here, uh, so it's a poly, close to a polyurethane foam and the blowing agent for it is pentafluoropropane, more commonly known as HFC-245A, the blowing agent. Now what is a blowing agent? The blowing agent is, is basically like a spray can. You have whatever you're wanting to do, like hairspray, if you're from the 80s, you remember hairspray. The hairspray is in the can, that's the stuff you're trying to spray out of the can. The propellant or the blowing agent is the other crap in the can that's blowing the hairspray out. Okay, so that's what this is. The blowing agent is blowing the foam out. All right, uh, and so that's what this is. It's uh, I guess it's approved by the EPA, even though it still has some issues with uh, uh, atmospheric pollution and whatever. Uh, I'm not quite sure about all that. I don't keep up with that stuff. All right. Uh, so let me uh, reset the camera and we'll continue on. So this uh, core stage is built in northern Alabama uh, at a NASA facility that is operated by Boeing. All right? uh, and then once it is manufactured there, it's put together, everything's welded up. Uh, the, um, it's not in a single piece. All right? You've got these, it's put in, it's manufactured and shipped in different pieces. Uh, the foam is applied, so on and so forth. Uh, those pieces are loaded onto a barge that goes down from northern Alabama down to the Gulf Coast, then through the Gulf of Mexico, around up the, uh, the Atlantic side of uh, Florida, the east coast of Florida, and into Kennedy Space Center. I think that's about like four, five hundred mile uh, trip or something like that, okay? So, uh, let's see here. Now, this thing consists of five sections. Okay, I've put six sections up here, but there's five. This section up at the top is not a uh, formal, or whatever you want to call it, it's not a formal part of this core stage. I've just put it there because, because that's where I wanted to put it. Plus, it's usually it's uh, orange, I believe, on the uh, SLS, so I might not include it in orange, okay? Uh, so, it consists of five stages, okay? or five sections, I should say, not stages. Stages is something completely different than the sections. Now, we have the forward skirt where the flight computers, uh, avionics, and cameras are, some avionics, and of course, cameras are installed. That is this little ring up here in uh, labeled B. That is the forward skirt, all right? Uh, the next one, the next section we have is the LOX tank, or liquid oxygen tank, and as I said before, I believe liquid oxygen is stored at around negative 200 to negative 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that is this section right here, okay? Uh, the next one we have is the intertank, and that's going to be between the LOX tank and the liquid hydrogen tank. You have some avionics in there and your four booster hard points, and that's this area right here labeled D. Uh, now, what's a hard point? What is, what is, what is a four booster hard point? A hard point is a place that you mount something to something else, or you attach one thing to another thing, okay? In this case, the boosters need to be attached to the core. One attachment point, or one hard point for the boosters, is down here. The other one is up here, okay? Now, you will remember, if you've seen show footage, you've seen these uh, in some of the videos, probably, especially the one where they have the uh, video from the external tank as the shuttle is launching. When what you'll see closer to the camera is you'll see like a little tripod type of structure, no, bipod structure, all right? Uh, and that goes from the tank up to the shuttle. That's a hard point. It's the same concept here. There's an attachment point uh, to attach these boosters to the tank. There's one up here and one down at the bottom, okay? So that's one of the things this inter-tank uh, section serves. One of the functions this intertank section serves. Next thing is the liquid hydrogen tank, which is here E, which is this big portion here. Okay. 
uh, and that holds the liquid hydrogen. And if I remember correctly, liquid hydrogen uh, is uh, negative, somewhere between negative 400 and 500, negative 500 degrees Fahrenheit. I think it's closer to negative 500, if I remember correctly. I could be wrong. Uh, the next thing we have is the engine, and there's four RS-25 engines in there and the gimbals to control them because those engines can be gimbaled and that means moved around, all right? And that's section F, which is right down here. Even though I've drawn the engines in section G, we'll get into that later, but uh, this whole thing down here is the engine section, all right? And as I said before, uh, the top thing we have here is a launch vehicle stage adapter, and that's a right here, level A. This is basically just an adapter uh, thing, so you can put whatever your payload on top of the rocket, okay? Uh, let's see here, what else do we have? Uh, the attachment port, yeah, get the course, course serves as the attachment port for all of the other components of the Space Launch System, okay? As I went over already, you attach your solid rocket motors to this, you attach your payload to this, Okay, that's simple. All right. Uh, now the engines on here, which we'll go over specifically by themselves. We'll go over the engines. Uh, they consume a third of a ton of liquid hydrogen every second and 1.9 tons of liquid oxygen every every second. Now, a third of a ton doesn't seem like a lot. That's, you know, that's not very much at all. It's like 666 pounds, a little bit over that, right? 667 pounds, whatever. Um, so that's not a lot, but it is a lot of 600 pounds of, of liquid hydrogen is a lot of hydrogen, okay? Uh, and 1.9 tons of LOX, that doesn't seem like much either, but it's, it's quite a bit, all right? Compared to the uh, solid rocket boosters, these numbers don't seem very much, uh, very big at all because you've got something on the, uh, on the uh, solid rocket boosters like six tons of fuel a second. But you have to remember the fuel in the so or the uh, propellant in the solid rocket boosters is heavier, okay? Because it has other components. It's got aluminum in there, all right? It's got heavier, heavier atoms in there, okay? More atoms with more mass, all right? So that's one reason that these numbers seem a little bit low, perhaps, to you, all right? Uh, so the next thing we'll go over is uh, a little bit of an internal view here of the tanks, and we'll go over the engines. Let's go into a little more detail about the uh, core stage of the space launch system. All right, I'm drawing over here uh, a little a, deep, a more detailed diagram of it. All right, the internals and everything. Uh, now it's important to note about this uh, core stage. Uh, as well as uh, the space launch system, as well as uh, many other rockets uh, that use liquid fuels, is that the tank walls, the, the propellant tanks, the tank walls of those tanks, also are structural supports, okay? So when you look at this thing, when you see this thing on uh, TV or in pictures, what you're seeing right here and here are the, the tank walls themselves. On the other side of those tank walls is the liquid oxygen or the liquid hydrogen. All right, that's one reason you need that insulation on the whole thing. Okay, so these are not only uh, tank walls, but they're structural components, which means they have to support all of this mass that's above them. Okay. And they also have to take the stress and loads that are imparted on them from these engines here, as well as the boosters. Now remember we said the boosters connect uh, to the core at, at uh, two different points per booster. One is up here on the uh, inter, inter, uh, inter tank uh, stage or portion, and the other one is down here at the bottom, all right? So the, these uh, tank walls must also take the stress of that. Now, again, this is not a tank, okay? So these aren't tank walls. But the tank walls have to take stresses of the other parts of the spacecraft, okay? As they're moving around, accelerating, you know, twisting, flexing, all these other things that happen during launch and flight, okay? Now, these get filled uh, when the space launch system gets to the launch pad. Uh, these tanks, this liquid hydrogen tank down here and the liquid oxygen tank will be filled with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, all right? 
Now, when they are filled with uh, those liquids, uh, with the propellants, they'll shrink. Why do they shrink? Well, with the exception of water and a few other things, when you cool something down, it tends to shrink. The molecules or the atoms within that material will get closer together because they're able to get closer together. We're not gonna, this isn't going to be a solid state chemistry or chemistry thing, all right? Uh, but they're able to get closer together, okay? There's less energy in those, uh, in that system, all right? And when you heat them up, those molecules or atoms will get further apart because there's more energy in there. And again, we're not going to go into the, uh, the solid state chemistry and chemistry to explain that. But that's the mechanics of what's happening. So when you put liquid that is almost 300 degrees below zero in here, and about 400 degrees below zero in there, you're going to get quite a bit of shrinkage, all right? So you get a shrinkage problem. That can be a problem outside of rocketry too, uh, depending on the temperatures. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the LOX tank, which is up here at the top, it shrinks by about one and a half inches in, in uh, length, okay? The diameter also shrinks a little bit, but we don't really care about that, okay? Uh, the liquid hydrogen tank shrinks by about six inches in length. Um, and again, the diameter, we really don't care about how much that shrinks, but it does, okay? So what that means is that when there's, there's a bunch of connections in here, wires and piping and all sorts of things, and ducts. So when you have connections into things like that that are moving around and changing size, you're going to need... Uh, connections like piping and stuff that can also move around and swivel or, or uh, de increase or decrease in length. You can change the length of that, all, you know, all that stuff. So this is a little bit more complex than just attaching a PVC pipe between the, the bottom of the LOX tank and, and the engine assembly down here, okay? A little bit more complex than that, okay? Uh, let's see here. Um, now, you can see up here I have drawn as I draw the, the liquid oxygen, for example, this in shaded green here is the liquid oxygen level at the launch pad before, before the engines are ignited, okay? But what you see up here is there's a little space uh, with gas. This is, this is liquid down here. This is gas, okay? And the space above this propellant is called ullage, okay? And that's going to be there regardless of, of what you've got. You're going to have ullage. Uh, period, uh, on these liquid-fueled rockets, okay? The same thing happens up here in the liquid hydrogen tank. You have a little bit of space up here at the top that has gas in it, and it's called ullage, all right? I guess you could also call it headroom, but it's ullage. Uh, so this ullage starts out at a certain level, uh, pre-launch, okay? And as the fuel is consumed out of these tanks by the engines, this ullage increases. Now, because these tanks are closed systems, there's nothing coming into the tanks. What is happening here as fuel is being sucked out of those tanks? What's going on? All right. Well, you're creating, uh, you're reducing the pressure within these tanks. All right. So the pressure up here in this this ullage space decreases. Okay. This can have several problems, several issues. Uh, now, one of the issues you've got is you, when you have a rocket like this with these tanks, where the tank wall is against the or right up with the atmosphere, and, and it's, a, it's a structural component, you, you want the pressure difference between the outside of the tank and the inside of the tank to, to uh, basically, to put it in simple terms, you don't want a vacuum inside the tank. Does that make sense? You want the pressure inside the tank to be at least the, this is the same as the pressure outside of the tank, if not more. Now, we want more. That's what we really want. But uh, So you don't want to have a low pressure inside this tank relative to the outside atmosphere. Okay. So there are several ways to uh, address this. Okay. Um, one of the ways is uh, that you can have... Um, like liquid, or not, you'd have a helium, compressed helium in here, liquid nitrogen tanks, so on and so forth, uh, that as this liquid in these, uh, these propellant tanks 
is, is decreases, as the amount of liquid decreases, the liquid nitrogen, or, or I'm sorry, the uh, nitrogen or the helium will flow in up here at this ullage space to keep the pressure, okay, to keep it pressurized to the correct levels, all right? Now, uh, this isn't used in the space launch system and it wasn't used in the space shuttle. Uh, it's a little bit more complex. You're, you get into other issues where you, you get uh, various mass fractions, you know, uh, you don't want to deal with having basic, basically wasted mass. If you send um, uh, liquid nitrogen tanks and the liquid nitrogen as well, or helium and all that, up with this system, essentially it's wasted. It's wasted mass, okay? Because it's going to be returning back with the, the uh, stage, and you know you, you haven't used it, okay? Along with the, the gas inside, the nitrogen and the helium inside of those tanks, it's just, it's just wasted, okay? So to get around that, what you can do, and that, that's what I've written up here, uh, you can control this by, uh, you can control the pressure on the tanks by uh, pressurizing the tanks using pressurization gas, which is inert, which would be your nitrogen uh, or your helium, okay? Uh, you can also control that by pressurizing the tanks using gas from the engines. You can pump some of that gas back up into this olive space to keep pressure in there. Okay, and uh, that's what I've written right here, and that is a uh, called autogenous uh, type of tank, and that's what the space shuttle is or was. That's what this is as well. Okay, so we've got our tank pressurization kind of worked out here. All right, so let's go into some other problems that can be uh, encountered when you're sucking a lot of fuel out of here or a lot of propellant out of these tanks at a high rate of uh, of speed. I guess you would say. So as the uh, propellant is removed from these tanks, again, a, a lot of propellant per second, okay, is, consumption is very high, uh, the ullage increases, what is that going to lead to? If, if you have a, a large bucket, let's just say you have a, a big bucket, and it's got a handle, and you fill that with water, and you start moving it around, what happens? You go from a stationary bucket with some liquid in it and some air on top of that liquid, and it's not moving around because it's stationary, so it's, it's fairly stable, okay? You start to move it around a little bit, what happens? It starts to get unstable. That water starts to move around, okay? And that's what happens with this ullage. can, can also cause a, a situation like that, instabilities, okay? Um, so... Oh, let's see, I've written that right here, yes. Least instability if uncontrolled, okay? Now what they can do is that can be controlled using something called anti-slosh baffling, okay? And what they do is, it depends on the system that you're working with. Um, you know, this anti-slosh baffling is in more than rockets, it's in like tankers, like fire trucks, you know, all these other things. Um, and it will help, it doesn't stop the movement of the liquid, it slows it down, makes it more manageable, okay? Uh, so what you'll have on these tanks, for example, would be some baffling, I probably should have drawn it up here, let me draw it. You'll have uh, some baffling, let's say this is the tank wall, all right? And down here is basically what you would call the drain. Okay, this is where the liquid is, the, the propellant is being sucked out of the tank by the uh, pumps down here. Okay. Uh, and around the edge of this tank, you could have baffles like this. Okay, all the way around. And there's many, there's many more than this. I've just drawn eight. There's, there's more than that. Okay. But they prevent, they, they slow the liquid down as it's moving around in there. Okay. They don't prevent it from moving. They merely slow the movement down. Okay which will lead to more stability, It'll be a more stable system, okay? And that's in both of these. Both of these tanks have that issue, so they both need anti-slosh baffles. Now, um, rapid propellant consumption may lead to another problem, and that is the formation of vortices. Now, what does that mean? Well, if down here at the bottoms of the tanks, uh, and I've drawn here, we've got where the fuel is being sucked out of the tanks by the pumps. Okay, by the fuel pumps. And 
That can lead, because it's being sucked out so rapidly, it could lead to a situation like you see in your bathtub or your toilet or your sink where a vortex will start to form in the bottom there. All right? Now, why is that a problem? Well, it's a problem because it uh, can allow gas to be ingested by the engines. How does that happen? Well, again, if you go look at your toilet, it's probably the easiest example to use, you'll see that the liquid before you flush, the water is basically flat, all right? And then as the flush progresses, you get a situation like this, okay? Like the, the water will form a, vort a, vort a, vort a vortex, okay? But there's still a little bit of water here at the bottom, all right? Let's say the holes down here. Still a little bit of water at the bottom, but again, as it continues to progress, the water moves to the side and you can get air going into there, okay? And you will see this with your toilet or even with your, uh, your dish uh, sink or your bathtub or whatever. When the air starts getting ingested in there, you hear the slurping and the gurgling and all that stuff. Even in your toilet, you, know that you hear that slot, that weird, that's not a sloshing sound, but at the end of the flush, you hear that like, type of sound. That's air being ingested into the toilet, okay? And the same thing can happen down here uh, in, these, in these fuel tanks, or, or not fuel tanks, these propellant tanks, okay? So, how can we deal with that? Well, we control that using anti-vortex baffles, okay, which are similar to this, except let's say that we have, they can be constructed in, in a few different ways. Let's say we have the bottom of the tank, or not the bottom of the tank, but the, uh, ooh, we don't want to draw on this with that. Uh, let's do it with this here. Um, let's say we have the bottom of the tank here, okay? We're not going to draw the whole thing. That's the bottom of the tank, right there. And then we've got the, uh, this is leading off to the pump, okay? leading out of the tank. What you can do is you can insert baffles in here, all right, like that. This is looking at it from the side, okay, and let's just say it goes down to there. This is looking at it from the side, okay. The liquid's going to come in here, the, the propellant's going to come in this way, like so, like that, down that way, all right. Now, if we look at this from above, what we're going to see is we'll see this, this is our drain, essentially, okay? And let's just say this is the, the tank, all right? You'll have something like that. These baffles from the, from the top will look like this, okay? And it's, your liquid is basically flowing into here, all right, like that. Hopefully that makes sense. That will help control these vortices and prevent them from forming, okay? Uh, some, I think some bathtubs might have something like that. I can't, I might be confusing something else, but something like that. Um, again, to control the vortices, to prevent uh, gas from being ingested into the engines and, of course, the turbo pumps and all that fancy equipment uh, that you don't want gas getting into, all right? At least not in places it's not supposed to be in, okay? So let's see here, we've got the, the slosh and the, and the vortex taken care of. Now, as this propellant is consumed, what, what do we think is happening here uh, as the propellant is consumed as far as mass goes? All right, we see that the mass here is fairly evenly distributed over the tank, same thing here. As the propellant is consumed, it drops, right? The level of the propellant drops. What does that lead to? Well, it leads to more mass being at the bottom of the tanks than at the top. Now that can lead to a shift in the center of gravity uh, with this. And if the system is not designed properly with everything laid out properly, and if the control computers, the flight computers and everything aren't programmed properly, that can lead to instabilities and flying off course and all that other stuff. However, you know, things are designed properly, the computers are programmed properly, and so on and so forth, to kind of avoid that. Not to kind of avoid that, to avoid it, okay? Now, for you hardware, you computer types, uh, uh, this stuff is, the flight computers for this uh, are a, uh, based on a power PC, which is, uh, back in the day, it was a uh, processor designed by, jointly designed by Intel and Motorola, which at the time were, or no, I'm sorry, IBM and Motorola. 
Um, so that's what you got there. Uh, it's 1990, I want to say 97, I think, is when it was released, I believe. So it's fairly old, but with space systems like this, a lot of the stuff you run into is fairly old because it is proven, okay? With this stuff, we don't need fancy nonsense like touch screens and all that garbage. We need things that work and are proven to work in these types of environments, all right? Uh, so, with this processor, these flight computers, there are over 700 sensors that are picking up all sorts of data in here, okay? And those computers and sensors, the uh, actuators, the pumps, and all the stuff in here, cameras and everything, is connected using about 45 miles of cable, which is kind of crazy. It's a lot of cable, and you'll find these in cable bundles. Uh, building cable bundles, if you've never seen them before, um, it's done by hand. Um, I can't I don't know if it's most of the time these days, or, or a lot of the time, or half, whatever. But a lot of it's done by hand, and if you see these cable bundles, it is definitely a skilled, skilled labor type of thing. Uh, to build these and make them look so nice and everything. Uh, and again, it's not for looks, it's for function, but usually good function is aesthetically pleasing. So it may not be pretty, but it's aesthetically pleasing, all right? So that's for you uh, hardware type of people out there if you're interested in that, okay? Uh, so that's it for the core, the details about the core. Um, well, maybe is it? Uh, well, you can see the, uh, the, the, the measurements here, the length of these. I will listed right there. Other than that, um, the core is pretty darn simple. Uh, the engines are the part that's a little bit more complex. All right. Let's talk about the uh, engines, the main engines, I guess you could call them, uh, for the space launch system, which are mounted at the bottom of the core stage. Now, these engines are were also used physically. Not just the design thing was based on, but the engines were physically used on the space shuttles, okay? So, they're the same engines as used on the space shuttles. Uh, basically, when that program ended, when the shuttle program ended, they took a lot of the components from the shuttles and the booster, uh, I don't know if they did the booster, yeah, they did the boosters as well. Uh, a lot of this hardware, they broke it down, stored it, and now they're using it over again. They're bringing it back out and they're going to use it over again, okay? Uh, so there are four of these RS-25 engines on uh, each core stage of uh, the SLS, all right? Uh, each of these engines weighs three and a half tons and produces 250 tons of thrust. So that's, uh, that's a lot of thrust for a little bit of weight. Um, now, to produce that 250 ton thrust out of quite a small weight, uh, these engines will use a stage combustion cycle. Now, what is that? Essentially, what you're going to be doing is you're going to take your, uh, a portion of your fuel that's coming in, which is the liquid hydrogen, and a small portion of your oxygen, your oxidizer, which is going to be oxygen that's coming in to the engine, uh, and you're going to run those through some small combustion chambers. Then you're going to use the gases from those combustion chambers to drive turbo pumps. Those turbo pumps will then pull the fuel and the oxidizer into the uh, system and inject it into the combustion chamber of the engine. All right? And we'll talk about that here in a moment. Uh, now, one of the functions uh, of these engines is to provide pressurization gases for the liquid hydrogen and the liquid oxygen tanks because those need to remain pressurized. And uh, when you are pulling fuel out of those, what are you doing? Uh, one of the things you're doing is reducing the pressure in there, okay? Uh, so these operate at, in the combustion chamber here, the uh, pressure can be 7,000 PSI and the temperature can be around 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Uh, and that's going to require some special cooling, which we will get into shortly. All right, when we get into the staged uh, combustion cycle uh, operation. And the exhaust velocity out of these things can be up to, nine, well, a little bit more than 9,500 miles per hour. So that's all the gases coming out of here, which is basically water, okay? Uh, water vapor coming out of here is going to be traveling at about 9,500 miles an hour, okay? Now, 
How does the stage combustion cycle work? Well, it's a little bit of a complex process. Uh, it's, it's, but the, the, uh, the engineering of it is complex, okay? Uh, because it, you've got to go back into loops and lots of piping and pumps and all this other crap, all right? The concept is simple, though. And so I've drawn a relatively simplified version of a stage combustion cycle, uh, particularly the one that's used on the RS-25. There are very, multiple variations of stage combustion, um, but this is the one, again, this is very much simplified, uh, that's used on these RS-25 engines, all right? So here, right, right here we have, in brown, we have the, the, uh, the engine, the part that you see right here is the exhaust nozzle, and then the combustion chamber that's attached to the engine, okay? Up here, these two things are turbo pumps, all right? And then up here are two combustion chambers, all right? Now, you notice that we have three combustion chambers here. One of them is the main combustion chamber that's attached to the nozzle or the, the main engine itself, okay, the main part of the engine itself. Then you have two smaller ones here that are attached to the turbo pumps, okay? So, what happens with this is you will have some of your fuel coming in. It's going to go through this turbo pump, get pumped down to the nozzle, go back up into this combustion chamber and this combustion chamber and then it's going to be some of it's going to be combusted in those it's going to go through these turbo pumps here back out and into the main combustion chamber now this may be like what is going on here you're burning all your fuel up in here and what, what's happening okay well i'll tell you what's happening you're only, since you've only got a small portion, I should go over the LOX path uh, as well. Uh, you've also got your liquid oxygen coming in, and you've got it going through the turbo pump and into the combustion chamber. You've got a small portion of that, a very, very tiny portion of that compared to the overall portion, coming into these combustion chambers, all right? So, even if you have all of your fuel going into these combustion chambers, most of it will never get burnt because there's not enough oxygen to burn it, all right? So what you'll end up having, having here is a fuel-rich mixture coming out of these combustion chambers and into the main combustion chamber, where then the rest of this oxygen will combine with the remaining hydrogen that's in there and combust, providing the main power output, essentially, okay? Uh, let's see here. Uh, also, you've got your pressurization gas coming out of these turbo pumps. Well, this one is the, on the turbo pump side. This is also the turbo pump side here, but it's after it has already ran through this strange drawing part I have here on the engine. Okay, it's the hydrogen gas here is coming uh, out off this side. Now, these two go to your pressurization uh, up in your, up, uh, in your uh, fuel oven. Uh, fuel and oxidizer tanks to keep those pressurized, all right? Now, what on earth is the fuel line doing down here next to this 6,000 degree area, or area that's going to be somewhere in here around 6,000 degrees? Why would you do that? Well, what's happening here is you got to remember this stuff, this liquid hydrogen coming down here is what uh, was it, uh, negative 420 something degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. It's really cold. Okay, it gets warmed up a bit here going through the turbo pump, but you've got in this engine you've got uh, channels that are machined throughout the engine here, the metal of the engine. Okay, and what's going on is this coolant is coming down to the bottom of the nozzle here, and it's traveling through all of those channels and it's picking up some of that heat as it travels through. So by the time it gets up to here, it's been warmed up quite considerably and a lot of heat has been taken out of this metal here for the engine, okay? So that's how one, well, it's the way that you keep it cool and from melting and you keep that structural integrity and so on and so forth. Uh, what else? Um, oh, yes, I uh, think I didn't write up here. Each of these pumps, or I should say, the, uh, the hydrogen, the fuel turbo pump, can produce, it develops, um, 70,000 horsepower. That's not this horsepower here. That's just the turbo pump. 
To pump all this fuel, it developed 70,000 horsepower, approximately. To pump all of this oxygen here, this turbo pump develops approximately 20,000 horsepower. So together with these turbo pumps, we have almost 100,000 horse, 100, horsepower just to pump the hydrogen and the oxygen into this engine for the fuel. Now, that's a lot. Uh, did I see anything here? Uh, I don't believe I did. Uh, so yes, that is the overview of the RS25 engine. Uh, it's, I'm not, I didn't want to go into like the crazy technical details of this thing because uh, it's out of the scope of this video, um, which is targeted more towards people who are just wondering about you know, the basics of this stuff. The last component of the space launch system, uh, well, for purposes of this video, the last component of the space launch system that we'll cover today is the ICPS, okay, which is right here, the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, okay? Now, uh, and I've drawn it up here with the uh, forward skirt attached, uh, but it, that's not technically really part of the ICPS, I've just drawn it that way. Okay, uh, so here's a little diagram of the ICPS, okay, it's 45 feet long and it consists of three main components, at least, again, for purposes of this video. Now, this is derived from uh, the uh, Delta Cryogenic Second Stage. Now, what is that? Well, there's a bunch of rockets that have been, well, were developed for uh, the Air Force, uh, or I should say by the Air Force. Um, for the Air Force and also for commercial things, um, called Delta, Delta one, two, three, all the way up to Delta. F I think we have Delta five. Do we have? To, I think we have Delta five now. It's been so long since I looked. Um, but this has been used in those uh, for its entire existence. I think it's something like twenty some. I think there's twenty something flights of this thing. I believe, uh, and they've all been successful. All right. So that's where this is derived from. It's changed a little bit to meet the needs of uh, NASA, but it, it, like a large, a huge portion of NASA's stuff that they have, it's derived either directly or through some convoluted way from a military piece of hardware, okay? Uh, now the empty weight of this is 7,500 pounds. So it's, you know, it's not that heavy considering it's something that's 45 feet long, okay? And uh, I believe this was uh, 16, 16, yeah, 16.7 feet wide, all right? So it's not that heavy considering its size, okay? Now, with that 7,500 pounds, it's going to be carrying 60,000 pounds of propellant. Now, that propellant, again, is liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. The fuel is the hydrogen. The oxidizer is the oxygen. Imagine that. Okay. And it also has a single RL-10 that develops around 25,000 pounds of thrust. But wait, you might be thinking, how are you going to move a 60,000, well, almost 70,000 pound thing with 25,000 pounds of thrust? Well, you got to remember, we're operating in space uh, where the gravity is less. So on Earth, this will weigh somewhere around 70,000, a little under 70,000 pounds, okay, here at sea level. Uh, when you get up where this thing is supposed to operate, it's going to weigh quite a bit less, okay? At least as far as the engine's concerned, it's going to weigh quite a bit less, all right? Uh, but the engine will still have the same thrust. It'll be 25,000 pounds worth of thrust, okay? Plus, you have to also remember that in space, because gravity doesn't affect us in the same way uh, as it does here, uh, it's probably a bad way to put it, um, you're not working necessarily against gravity, okay? So you can have 25,000 pounds of thrust successfully moving a 70,000 pound object perfectly fine. Now it's going, if you want it to move a little bit faster, or I should say accelerate a little bit faster, you're going to have to have higher thrust. If you can deal with a lower acceleration or a slower acceleration, you can have a little bit, of, a little less thrust, all right? So no matter what, this thing will move in space 
with 25,000 pounds of thrust, even if the spacecraft weight itself, plus you also have to remember this thing's not only pushing itself, but it's pushing the Orion with it, all right? So no matter what, it's going, those, it's going to move with that small amount of thrust, okay? Now, uh, this also has hydrazine powered attitude control thrusters. Now, what's hydrazine? It's a poisonous chemical that's been used in spacecraft and even some aircraft uh, for quite a while. Um, it's proven. Um, in fact, uh, I did a video a while back um, on a Twitch stream actually where I was covering the space shuttle APUs, which were hydrazine powered. Uh, you can find that on my YouTube channel. Uh, the video was not made for YouTube, it's a clip, it's a snippet from us, that stream, so keep that in mind. So these attitude control thrusters will allow uh, the ICPS to move the, the ICPS itself and the Orion spacecraft around. They control the attitude, essentially. You want to point it up, you point it up this way, whatever. Um, you want to roll it a little bit, well, you turn the those thrusters on for the roll and it rolls. All right. Now this thing performs three functions. That's all it's for and then it gets handed off or gets disposed of is disposed of uh, in space. No longer used. Okay. One of the functions of this thing is to circularize the orbit of Orion and ICPS after it separates from uh, the core stage here, okay, because when it separates, it's going to be going uh, in a non-circular orbit, it's an elliptical orbit, right? So well, the first function that it's going to perform is it's going to do kind of a circularization orbit, okay, to get that orbit circularized, okay? Then what it's going to do is after all that's done, it's going to perform a long burn to basically get Orion into a translunar injection, right? It's going to Translunar injection, which basically means it's going to shoot it towards the moon. Now, is it going to shoot it directly towards the moon? No, it's going to shoot it, up, shoot it on an intercept course to the moon. So it would be kind of like taking an arrow and releasing it, if you will, at a target that's moving. Okay, you got to track the target a little bit. All right. So that's the second function of it. Finally, its third function is to dispose of itself. Okay, now we're not meaning destroy. Destroy, dis dispose does not mean destroy. Dispose means basically just putting it, throwing the trash, essentially, whatever, wherever your trash may be. Uh, how this is going to do it is it's going to separate from Orion and then it's going to be commanded to put itself into a heliocentric, heliocentric orbit, which basically means a sun centered orbit, all right? Uh, and Supposedly, that's going to not cause any problems. In reality, yeah, it's not going to cause any issues, or it should for, for us, just one little thing, okay? Um, this should be just fine. But of course, if you get a bunch of people doing this uh, and leaving their trash everywhere, well, you know what happens when you get trash everywhere, but that's a separate subject. So, um, that is, we're not going to go into the RL10 engine, because uh, it's really the video is mainly about this, which is the space launch system. This stuff up here is is part of it, kind of, um, but this is payload essentially as I marked up here, okay? Uh, so that is it for the ICPS. Let's cover the schedule, if you want to call it that, of uh, what we're going to see or we hope to see uh, during the launch of the space launch system. Okay. Basically what this is going to be is going to be a timeline of events all right, that we're going to be looking for. These are important events. Uh, some of them are similar to the shuttle, others are not. Okay. So, uh, so what I've got here is I, this is adjusting it, right? sorry. Uh, I've got a little diagram that Bob Ross would think was amazing, uh, drawn here of our space launch system on the mobile launcher with the tower and of course those aren't the crawler wheels or anything or treads those are basically the uh, how the mobile launcher is set down on the the concrete there okay so that's the SLS down here uh, I've drawn up here an arrow that shows what a uh, flight path that we're going to take the real shape of this doesn't matter for these purposes all right 
Down here I have two arrows drawn as well. Okay, those are going to be for something. Uh, there's some events there that are happening. And I've labeled each event that we're looking for along this line. A through uh, N. Okay, so they're all labeled. And then what I've drawn over here is a little table that tells us what is going on at each of these events. Okay? So, here at, at the first uh, item, down here is item A, we can see the time for that is zero, the speed here is zero, uh, the speed of the uh, SLS and the altitude of the SLS, the, the rockets, all right, is zero and zero there. What event is that? Well, that's launch, that's T0, okay, that's when they push the launch button and the thing starts going, all right? Now, B, which is item B, which is right here above the tower, okay, you can see it right here above the tower. That's going to be when the rocket clears the tower, okay, and that's going to happen about seven seconds after the launch starts. Uh, the SLS will be traveling about 80 miles an hour at that point, and it'll be at an altitude of about 570 feet, okay. Now, after it does this, it's going to be, if you remember seeing um, footage of the shuttle, uh, the shuttle clear the tower and it will start a roll and a little bit of a pitch uh, um, uh, movement going. The same thing is going to be happening with the, the SLS. It's going to clear the tower, it's going to start a roll, and then it's going to move over uh, a little bit to, uh, it's going to rotate a little bit to uh, go on the proper trajectory that it needs. All right? Now, this is all computer control, of course. Uh, by onboard computers uh, with the SLS, okay? It's constantly checking things and adjusting and performing these steps, okay? But with a bunch of other steps as well. Uh, item C here is uh, right there. Uh, that will be item C. This is where you're going to run into the maximum dynamic loads on the spacecraft, okay? And this will be a call out, or probably will be a call out, like it was with the shuttle, okay? Uh, this roll might be a call out as well, like it was with the shuttle. Now, with the SLS, there's no need to call these out because they're not communicating with anybody on the spacecraft, but I'm assuming that they're still going to call them out so that people know what's going on, okay? Uh, this this uh, maximum uh, dynamic load, or max Q, is going to happen at about 1 minute and 10 seconds after launch or into the launch. The spacecraft is going to be going about 1,000 miles an hour, and its altitude will be about 42,555 feet, um, which if you're in electronics, that would be a nice little timer for you, a little 555 timer. Anyway, <laughs> that aside, we have D over here. Item D is associated with a little arrow that comes off and ultimately goes down here. Okay, what is that? That's going to be booster separation, and that happens about 2 minutes and 12 seconds into the uh, flight of the rocket. Uh, it's going to be going, the rocket itself is going to be going about 3,170 miles an hour at an altitude of 158,000 feet. By this point, the rockets, the SRBs, will have no fuel left essentially. The thrust that they may, or the fuel that they may have left, is going to be useless. It's not going to be worth carrying that weight uh, with it any longer. So they're going to jettison that, or the rocket's going to jettison that and be done with it. Okay? Uh, the next item is item E, which is up here. Uh, there's nothing really associated, that with on the associated with that on this diagram. That's going to happen in about 3 minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, it's, uh, going, the spacecraft is going about 4,535 miles per hour at an altitude of 287,500 feet. This is going to be uh, the launch escape system uh, jettison. That tower on top. Uh, which you'll see it's on the little tower looking thing on top of the very top of the SLS, or I should say the Orion. That's the uh, uh, launch escape system there, okay? And that's going to be, it's got its own little rockets on there, and it's going to jettison off uh, because it's no longer needed, okay? The next thing that's going to happen is at the bottom of this arrow down here, okay, this, where it says boosters. These boosters, after being jettisoned, they're finally going to hit the Atlantic Ocean somewhere and be destroyed course, okay? That happens in about 5 minutes and 25 seconds into the flight. And remember, those are not going to be recovered. Uh, item G happens in about 8 minutes and 20, which is up here, 8 minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, this is going to be the core MECO, or core main engine cutoff, and I'm almost sure you'll hear a call out for that as well, even though this is computer control, you know, onboard computer control. 
uh, from the spacecraft. That's going to happen at about 17,430 miles an hour and at an altitude of 531,381 feet. So we're getting, you can see we're getting into large numbers here with the, uh, the speed and the altitude, all right? Item H up here, which does have an arrow associated with it right there, okay? That's going to be the core and ICPS separation at 8 minutes and uh, 30 seconds. Uh, we're going to be going 17,420 miles per hour at this point at an altitude of 547,000, yes, 560 feet. Uh, now, what you'll probably see here is it's a little bit odd, is that we have a discrepancy here. We've lost speed. Now, why have we lost speed? Well, because we're still affected by gravity here, uh, and you can see we've lost some speed, but we have gained some altitude, all right? So that's the reason that you're getting the speed differential here, okay? Item I, right there, okay, uh, is going to happen at 51 minutes. I almost said 51 seconds there, okay? This is going to be your IPS circularization burn start, the start of the IPS uh, orbit circularization burn, okay? That's going to be at a speed of 14,640 miles per hour and an altitude of 1,100 miles, okay? So you can see we've gained a little bit of speed here uh, between our uh, ICPS separation and the start of the circularization burn, okay? Now, why would that be? Well, it's because the rocket's starting to fall back to Earth, okay? But we're going to correct that. Um, let's see here, what else do we have? Item J is up here, okay, the rest of these are just up here, except L, that's going to come in later. So item J happens at 51 minutes and 20 seconds, that's the uh, circularization burn end, right, it's a cutoff, it's when they cut the engines off, uh, on the ICP, or in gen on the ICPS off. Uh, that's going to be at 17,740 miles per hour and also at 1,100 miles altitude. Okay, so what you can see here, this is a 20 second burn. Uh, it's gained us a little bit of speed, about 100 miles per hour, and it has not gained us any altitude. It's not intended to gain us any altitude. It's intended to take that elliptical orbit and turn it into a circular orbit. Okay. Now, item K at 30, uh, 1 hour and 37 minutes, we're the uh, spacecraft is going to be going about 16,800 miles per hour at an altitude of 521 miles, or I'm sorry, 520 miles. This is when the IPS, IPCS is going to start its transitor injection burn, which is to get this, the uh, Orion to the moon, okay? Uh, at about 1 hour and 46 minutes, item L here, is when the uh, core will make its splashdown. What we're really probably going to, what we probably won't see, today, uh, is we'll, what we're going to see with that is the uh, fragments of the core making, they're hitting the ocean, the Pacific Ocean this time, okay? That happens in about one minute, or uh, one hour and 46 minutes. Uh, item M happens in about one hour and 55 minutes. Uh, that's going to be the transitor injection uh, burn end, all right? And the spacecraft will be going at that point around 22,670 miles per hour at an altitude of 775 miles per hour. Now this is not quite the uh, speed that needs to escape Earth's gravity, but it is kind of close, okay? And at 2 hours and 5 minutes, we're going to see the IPCS separation from the Orion, okay? And that's going to happen at about... 19,625 miles per hour at an altitude of 2,300 miles. So hopefully we'll see all of these because if we don't, that means the spacecraft has gone crazy or something has happened and uh, the launch basically failed. Uh, and I hope this is going to be an enjoyable launch as well. Uh, I hope you all will enjoy it. And uh, that's about it for this video.